Philadelphia is steep in broadcast history. From the early pioneering days of broadcasting in the 1920s to today, Philadelphia has always been at the forefront. The Delaware Valley has been home to some of the best local programming in the country, starting with the early soap operas and children's shows to pioneering the best news formats in the country, much of it all began right here. From radio announcers to television personalities, cameramen to directors, these were the broadcasters that burned up the airwaves. These were the pioneers of Philadelphia Broadcasting. Welcome to the Pioneers of Philadelphia Broadcasting. Today we are in the presence of a real legend. She's also a friend. And I'd like to introduce you to Miss Peggy King. Hello, Peggy. Hello, Michael. It's almost like we don't know each other. <laughs> we live in the same building. We know each other. Very well. Um, I want to take everybody on a, on a tour of your life. And I think people who have seen you on the George Goebel show with Bob Hope and all these other people, they think, oh, what a great, easy life you have had. But I'm sure you've had your ups and your downs. Am I right? Oh, my, yes. Okay. Let's chronologically take it through. And I know the first thing is something that probably nobody knows about you. And that is how your mother was your aunt, became your mother. Do you want to explain that? Um, my uh, mother ad and, and father adopted me because they found out they could not have children. And uh, my aunt, uh, they were, my, my mother and her sisters were all raised in an orphanage. I think they came out of the orphanage and didn't know anything at all. And uh, suddenly, there I, there I, I was on the way. Mm -hmm. And that was the way it was handled. And uh, my parents, Margaret and Floyd King, took me. I never knew this until um, I got famous. And was, suddenly when you get famous, people come out of the woodwork. Mm -hmm. And someone came out of the woodwork and told me. I didn't think I really needed to know. But it doesn't make any difference. They're my parents right. and always would be, you know. How did, how did you, before you found out, how did you look at your birth mother? She was my favorite aunt. Uh huh. I was crazy about it. By the way, that's a good question because she was a wonderful singer. Not that she sang uh, for a living. She didn't. They were all raised in an orphanage that my, my mother and her sisters, their parents were gone. And, but she was the singer of the group and a good one. And that's where I got the voice. Now, you started to sing at a very, very early age also, didn't you? Yes. How old were you? The first time I sang in public, you mean? Public or even to your first to yourself? Oh, from the time I could uh, talk. Right. I was always singing. I drove everybody mad. I was an only child, so I didn't, you know, it wasn't quite so bad that I was always singing. Um, I started to think about it as a career when I was about, um, I went to, in Pennsylvania then you could go to school at five. And I went to school at five. That's when I first started to think about a career, yeah. I mean, anything there was to sing at school, I sang it mm -hmm. from the time I started, you know. Did the teachers think you were the, the it singer? Well, my first grade teacher did because she had gone all through, all through school there in South Greensburg, Pennsylvania with my dad. They were close friends. Uh -huh. So she was very pleased with the whole thing. I'm trying to think of when I knew I was a singer second grade, third grade maybe, I was pretty sure by the third grade that I was a singer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, at that time, you, you knew you wanted to sing, okay? Did you ever have anything else in your mind that you could have or would have done? Yes, so I wanted to be a teacher. Uh -huh. And as that works out, my daughter Susie is a teacher. You know, she teaches in California, she teaches the kids who are in this little area where she lives uh, picking the grapes. Mm. And of course, there's a there's a language problem. There's all kinds of you know, and, and I'm very proud of her. Oh yeah. yeah. Yeah, she kind of did what I had wanted to do, but there was really there was in my mind, I knew that it would never come to be because there was no money right. uh, for me to go to. I was just going to ask you that because you actually grew up in, with a poor family financially. Oh, very, very. And you you would tell me stories about 
the, the, the minimal food that you would eat. Minimal food is right. Yeah. What, what was, I mean, what kind of things were you eating? Uh, well, you know, we didn't have steaks. We didn't have anything fancy. You know, we had kind of, um, you know, eggs. And uh, I, I remember this really well. It was a big treat to me. It was the treat. I didn't like uh, meat very much. And we didn't have it very much. But on Saturday nights, we had hamburger sandwiches. Oh, wow, big and time. And I really, that was a big deal, and I really grew up liking them very much. I do to this day. Oh, that's fabulous. So as you grew up, you knew that your parents didn't have a lot of money. Oh, yes. And is it true that you decided to go into show business early to help support them? Yes, I wanted to buy them a house. It was, mm -hmm. it was, my, it was my dream. It was my fade. It was my everything. I wanted to buy them a house. I believe probably at 15, 16, you don't really think you're going to do something. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of a dream. But that was what I wanted to do. I wanted to buy them a house. Wow. It took me. And eventually. Eventually. You, you know, did. After, after the Goebbels show, I bought them a right. house. Right. Yeah. All right. Let's track ourselves up to that. All right. What was your first job as a singer? The first thing I got money for. Which means you're now a professional. Uh, I got out of high school uh, just a few days after I was 17, because you were allowed, uh, during that couple of years you were allowed to start very early. So that worked out for me. And I heard that um, I, we live 30 miles south of Cleveland. And someone told me that the biggest radio station in Cleveland was looking for a girl singer. And I thought, well, I'm going to have to start going to auditions. So I got on the bus and went to Cleveland and got the job. So you left your hometown, which was? Ravenna. Ravenna? It's, okay. Pennsylvania. It's five miles away from Kent, where Kent State is. Oh, OK. Yeah. But that was Pennsylvania. And I went and sang for the people at the radio station. And uh, I, I was thinking, you know, I'm going to audition 10 times while I'm here. I'm going to get a job. And I was just just to turn 17, because you could go at five in Pennsylvania when you, you know to school then. So I just, I was just turning 17. And I sang, and I, I remember this like it was yesterday. I would see faces were popping up and looking at me, and, and people were coming in, and people were motioning to people. And I thought, am I that bad? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you thought it was your bad? I thought I was bad, yeah. And then uh, suddenly, I, I noticed that the head of the station came in, and he was grinning and smiling. And so when the audition was over, they said, could you start tomorrow? Wow. And I, you know, I had just turned 17. I got out of high school at 16. And I said, uh, um, I have to go back to Ravenna and pick up my clothes. You know, if somebody can take me down there, I'll tell my parents, you know, I was only 17. Did your parents know you were going to Cleveland? Yes, for, they knew. Okay. Yeah, they knew. And uh, they sent somebody with me. I, I threw together a very small suitcase and went off to Cleveland and was going to, I was looking for a place to live. And one of the guys in, in the car, I don't know whether he was an announcer or what, I don't remember any longer, said, hey, the Cleveland Hotel, you know, has a big, huge area, you know, a, a nightclub, but, but nicer than that. Supper club, they called them mm -hmm. then. And they're looking for a girl singer. Why don't we just go over there and see what happens? So it was about 6 o'clock at night, and, and uh, they were there getting ready. And, and the, guys knew, the guys from the radio station knew them, and they said, we brought you somebody, we want, we'd like you to hear her sing. And I sang, and I got the job. So you got two jobs right away. I uh, got two jobs in a day and a half. And the job at the Cleveland Hotel came with a, a room and bath, <laughs> free. Or now, I couldn't have stayed. And I certainly couldn't travel back and forth to Ravenna every day. That was 30 miles, you know. Now, I want to dig a little bit. Yeah. You, you entered that audition for the radio station and the other with a certain amount of confidence. No, no. You, uh, I, that's what I want to know. No, no. I, I was doing it. Uh, to get myself, I was going to do every audition in, you know, the state until I got something. And I, no, I never dreamed. Uh, I, I remember saying to them when they said, 
the job is yours. And I said, you're kidding. I, I, I was very surprised. So I think everybody would want to know, here you are starting off, you had a little bit of confidence, but you were nervous? I don't really get nervous, but I was tense. Mm -hmm. You know, which tense is okay. You can use tense. You can't use nervous. Don't they say that when somebody's about ready to perform, that they have to have that kind of tension to do well? You have to have just enough tension, mm -hmm. you know, and it's very, it takes a long time to get that. Well, you know, you know, you're in the business. It takes a long time not to be too tense or, or too little tense. But it get, you know, after a couple of days with the mic at Clean Cleveland, I, I felt like I'd been there forever. And the fact that I, I, uh, I was getting, my, getting a room and board at, at the Cleveland Hotel, it was, and then I was working at night, and uh, because it was a hotel, it was over at 9.30, so I could get up at, at 7.30 to go and do my 8.30 show. It was, wow. it was kind of, yeah, it was sort of, and my parents, you know, I, I remember going home to visit my parents one Sunday, and they both just were still looking like they'd been hit over the head, you know. <laughs> It was a little more than they were expecting. Is that when your father gave you that advice? What did he tell you? He, is, uh, he told me that if I ever got a big hit, not to come home. You remember that, Michael? Mm -hmm. I think it was probably the best advice anybody ever could have given me. And do you think, because we're going to get to the, to the big time in a few seconds, yeah. but um, do you think that attitude was what really helped you besides your talent to make it having the right attitude? I think probably more than I ever realized it was going to. Yes, you need a good attitude. You, you need to be, uh, you, you need to know, if I knew I could sing, but I, I was also a kid, you know, and I was scary. Uh, yeah, I think you have to, I think if you don't know, someone is pretty quick going to tell you that you're no good. And I was about not going to have that happen. I was not about to let that happen. I think in this business, when you are a nice person, okay, people want to support you. Well, but you couldn't see that from just a couple of days, you know, with the band. I was trying to get to know the, the three guys and, and the, the leader who was totally mad, just totally nuts. I'll never forget him. I mean, mm -hmm. his name was George Sterney, and he, I do not know from what country he came, but it was what, he was one of those people who said, all right, all right, let's go, let's go, okay, okay. It, he drove me mad, and I thought, am I going to meet only mad people? Is, <laughs> is that what's gonna happen to uh, me now, you know? Uh, the answer is yes. <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> right, 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 the right, answer is yes. And I was able to, uh, I had Sundays and Mondays off, so I was able to go back to, you know, get on the bus and go home and see my folks. And uh, it was a very big surprise, not only to my parents, but to everybody in the neighborhood. You know, everybody was kind of, that's a little town, Ravenna. It's quite small. And everybody was saying, she's doing what? You know, it was kind of, um, and not only that, but I got both jobs in one day. Yeah. The big one at the biggest hotel and the one on the radio. How long did you stay on those two jobs? I stayed about um, about a year and a half, not maybe quite not a year and a half. And what was the next push? Um, I got a chance to go on the road with Charlie Spivak. And he was a very, very, very big band. Mm -hmm. A very, very terrible man, but I didn't know that. I mean, if I think if I had known him and how hard it was going to be, no, I guess I would have gone anyhow because I needed to. Did he find you because of the shows that you were doing? Uh, somebody told me in that last, I had to give them a week. You know, uh, I had to, if, 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 no, no, that, that would be backwards. I think the radio show was coming to an end is what's happening. Mm -hmm. That's it. And so I was looking for other work. And so I was already looking for work. So, yeah, of course. All right, so Charlie picked you up, and then you went traveling? I went on the road with Charlie Spivak. Like, where did you go? The place that all name bands go. I went to every major dancing, you know, the big, what are they called? I forget now what they Dance called. halls? I guess they were called dance halls, mm -hmm. yeah. Auditoriums, too, and, 
and we did uh, uh, schools. You know, in those days, you did you did a lot of colleges. I did an awful lot of colleges. All right, what did you learn from that experience? I learned that he was a jerk. <laughs> now, what did, what did you learn for yourself? How did you um, handle it? Yeah, by the time that first seven or eight months was up. I kind of knew what I was doing, you know, I, I knew how to make an entrance, I knew how to handle, handle being with a microphone all the time, I knew how to handle reporters because I, they, an awful lot of people came and did things with me. Um, I, by the time it ended, you know, that was over, I kind of, um, and that was when I went to Cleveland. I, and then the Cleveland thing, when that was over, uh, it was over because I got a band, and mm -hmm. as soon as that band was over, I went with the Ralph Flanagan band, and then a little while with Ray Anthony. So I was really, uh, I never had any trouble getting a job. Ray Anthony Flanagan, what were they like? Um, this puts me in a real spot because of the, what I would like to say, I can't say. Uh, Ray Anthony is 99 years old and still living. Did you know that? No, I did not, no. Uh, Ray Anthony only cared about flirting with women. Uh, Charlie Spivak was in the middle of, a, of his third or fourth divorce and took it out on me. Uh, who's, the, who's in the middle? Ralph Flanagan, right? Did I give him before? No, you didn't mention him. Ralph Flanagan hated what he was doing. He, he only wanted to be in the studio. He did not want to be on the road, and he took it out on me. Mm -hmm. So I just kind of, I knew that I needed to stay a year and a half or so in, you know, in, in these bands. I needed to do it because I had no, except what I sang in high school and what have you, I had no prior uh, you know, I just needed to do this. I needed some kind of backup for myself. Mm -hmm. I needed to know I could do it. But as it turns out, uh, band singing, let's face it, folks, if you can sing with a band, you can do anything, especially two bands, band leaders who are difficult to get along it's with. It's so interesting because when the bright lights shine, everybody thinks, and you're smiling because you're pretty perky Peggy King, bright lights shine, and people think, oh, this is so easy. But there's a lot of stuff behind it that... that there, with me, there was a goal, which we haven't spoken of. There was a goal, a very large goal. I wanted to buy my folks a house. Right. My mother was uh, an orphan by the time she was eight or nine and was raised in an orphanage. My father came from abject poverty. My, that, those grandparents were still alive on my father's side. I wanted to buy my folks a house. I was determined to buy them a house. So that kept you going. And that kept me going. All right, let, let's skip ahead. That's kind of an important thing to tell young people. Get something fixed in your head that you absolutely, positively know you're going to do or die, and it pushes you on. It, it helps to push you. And boy, you. did you get pushed on, because <laughs> you, you then, ha let's, let's move to California now. Yeah, well, okay. uh, I, I got, let's see, I left both bands and went out to California because someone from a movie studio called me and said that, they, that Arthur Freed wanted to give me a contract. Now, he was the biggest producer in the world at that time. A film producer. Yeah, and it was Judy Garland. You know, everything, her whole life had depended on him. Hmm. And uh, I figured if he's good enough for Judy Garland, you know, I didn't realize he was going to turn out to be the great jerk of all time, but then everybody knows that. I'm not telling any so secrets. So show business can be rough. Uh, yeah, but um, I was going to be at Metro MGM for a year, and I knew it. And I decided that movies were falling apart then. Television was coming in. Mm -hmm. That's the 50s. And I decided that I was going to take every lesson, learn everything. I was going to take... I had a, a good, strong Pennsylvania, Ohio, and Pennsylvania accent. And I decided I was going to, you know, work with all of the, the people that had to do with, with, talk, with uh, speaking at, at the studio, and with the great Bobby Tucker, who played piano for everybody, starting with Judy Garland. I decided to learn the Great American Songbook from him. I decided to use, you see, so far, and I've never said this before in an interview, 
so far now that because we know each other so well, Michael, that I, that I it, I'm thinking too while I'm talking. The truth is, I I was kind of doing it in in steps, and and maybe that's how it all worked out. And, they, so well. and the steps meant. I something. never took the next step until I knew I had that one down. Mm -hmm. Now Metro. When did I you was, do any movies at Metro? I did uh, some, you know, little parts. I was taken there to do a movie called Jumbo, and they didn't do, oh. the, yeah, and, and they didn't do it for, oh, they did it, I, I don't even know who was in it. It was such a flop, you know, so mm -hmm. I kind of was, felt that I beat that one. Um, I took every lesson. I worked with the great, you know, dance teachers, the great, uh, I, I just took every lesson though acting. When I came out of Metro, I was ready for the big time. So that was your college? It was my college. It's a great way to put it, yes. Mm -hmm. Yep, it was my college. All right, so now you did some bit parts in film. Yeah. And then you also wound up doing a show in California too. I uh, uh, did a, a daily show where I was kind of like a singing Vanna White. But you didn't I, turn letters. No, I didn't turn letters, no. But I was, uh, I, I talked, you know, went into the audience and talked to them. It was live, too. And I sang and I danced and I did all that. And uh, I did it at the big studio at the corner of, of, um, of Vine Street, you know, the big NBC Hollywood and studio, Vine. Hollywood and Vine. And I last, I, I, it was with a, a, a guy that ran it, you know, that had it. And I, um, sort of figured I'd do that the rest of my life, you know, my career. I, I, it was fun. I, I, it was very well, very good paying job. I was learning everything. I was singing with a live band. How old were you then? Uh, 19. So in two years. Yeah, because I got out of school, I was barely 17. Yeah. yeah, I'm saying in two years, you made some pretty big jumps. Uh, I always thought, now that we're talking about it, I always thought that that was what made my career so tight and so so easy for me to slide right along because I I didn't need a lot of time to do it. I realized that from that time that right. I didn't need it. But you weren't you weren't and never were and even to today jaded by the business. No, no. How come? Uh, I I I I guess something you want. From the time you begin to think, um, I, I don't understand how you can get mad at it. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. I wanted to do it. All right, now let's let's move forward again to really what everybody seems to know you about. You were on the number one NBC show, yes, George Gobel, the George Gobel show, um, at a, at a time when the competition for television was was great. Same studio that I'd been working in the whole time with these other shows. Mm -hmm. And bang, within, and the same, and within, I, I don't know, two weeks I couldn't walk on the street. Isn't People, that amazing, the power of television? It, the power of television is Yeah, incredible. but George picked you out like that, didn't he? Well, he saw me on a local station. Right. He saw me on that station where I finally worked with him. Mm -hmm. He saw me doing a local show. I did a local show there where I was sort of a singing Vanna White. Mm -hmm. And I, I, he, he saw me and he said her. They never looked at anybody else. And, and I, when he saw how tiny I am, because he's very small, you know, he wears really big, whatever they're called. Lifts, heels. Lifts. Yep. Uh, when he saw that I was tiny, but I'm 5'2", he just was the happiest man alive. Mm -hmm. you know, it was, worked out really well. Oh, that's great. Now, you not only sang on that show, but you were in a lot of the skits. Yes, I was. Okay. Uh, with, the, with, the, with the different movie stars who came on, yeah. And who were some of the stars that you worked with? Oh, my. Angela Lansbury. I love her so much. She's such a great actress. Jeffrey, uh, Jeff uh, Hunter. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. I'm well, sure. if it comes to you, then just interrupt me. Okay. Okay. Yeah, you know, there were hardly anybody who didn't come on the show. Mm -hmm. I mean, they all came on the show. Now, were you still at Metro at the same time? No, no. You left. Did no. you ever go back and do movies? I never went back and did anything. I never went near Metro again. Mm -hmm. no. But you were in a movie that was the um, forerunner of a, sh of a movie called Airport. Yes. Air yeah. What was the name of Airplane. that? Airplane. Airplane, rather. Yeah. What was that movie? 
It was ab about an actual thing that happened where the, um, let's see, Linda Darnell was in it and Dana Andrews. It was about a real plane th accident that happened because they had both uh, had the same food and it was poisoned. Mm. And that is, uh, that is when the law was passed in this country that, you, that uh, the person who's driving the plane and the person who's, whatever that person is called, the other person. The co-pilot. The co-pilot are not allowed to eat the same food. Mm -hmm. Has to come in two packages from two different places. Well, but the one you did was... That was zero hour. Zero hour, that's right. Yeah. And that was, that was really a drama. Oh, gosh, And you played yes. the part of... I was, I was the, uh, there was only one stewardess in those days on those planes, and I was the stewardess. You were the flight attendant there. Yep. And, uh, but then that led another production company to do a film on it called, it was it Airplane? It was a comedy. Yeah, somebody did one called Airplane that, that they did a takeoff on us. Yeah. Same story. Yeah, <laughs> yes. Can you imagine something so serious became so, you know? It was very hard to do because you have, you have six or seven people shaking the plane, you know, mm -hmm. and making it, and, and it, it crashed. We all had to go through the crash. Interesting story, quickly, about the background. It was an actual airplane in the studio? It was the body of an airplane. There right. were no wings. Mm -hmm. It was the body of an airplane. Now, you also worked with Bob Hope on the Academy Awards. What I year did. was that in? Do you remember? Or? That had to be 1956. Okay. And what was he like? Oh, well, I had worked with him a lot. I loved Bob. Um, he was wonderful. He was a wonderful, wonderful man. I loved working with him, and that, you know, when you arrive there to do it, there's these, these long, 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 long streets that they make up, you know, so that you walk down and everybody's taking your picture and you're... That's pre-red carpet, then. Yeah, pre-red carpet. And uh, they were yelling, Peggy, Peggy, which was a big kick, you know. And, of course, I knew Bob. We had worked together a lot, so it was a, a snap for me to... With him. I mean, he's a legend. I was on a lot of tours with Bob out of the country. The USO. The USO. Wow. How many d different places did you see? I guess the big one that probably that you'd want to hear about is Korea. During the war. During the war. Wow. You didn't run into any problems then, did you? Uh, no. It's the strangest thing. You know, you're you're surrounded by by thousands and thousands of young men in uniform. <laughs> I mean, if anything went wrong, they certainly would come and, and protect you. You know, mm -hmm. and I have this this real connection with the boys in the uniform. I really do. I have a big connection, and still to this day, I do. All right. Now, we're going to move ahead a little bit. Yeah. You also worked with other legends like Jack Benny. Oh, yeah, Jack and I were very close friends, yes. Yeah, and who else? Uh, the other, well, let's see, who were the other comics of the time? Uh, George Burns and Gracie Allen. And one thing that most people don't know is that you were good friends with a very famous woman movie star. Oh, you, Debbie. Debbie Reynolds. Yeah, De right. I, uh, the, the Reynolds family took me in and I stayed there at Debbie's house for a, and and it was just a little house she, she had twin beds in her in her bedroom I stayed there for about 6 months you know because uh, there was there was no money coming in whatsoever when I was under contract yeah, I wasn't working yet and and then I started to do uh, nightclubs and that helped a lot yeah i mean all these people that you've met are really legends today they are right That's true. but you also and this is amazing for me you have found a new career. I never really, you know, went around saying I'm looking for a career night and day. I, I, I just, uh, everybody was bugging me to sing and my daughter had not ever, re I mean, you know, as a kid she heard me, but she had never really, my daughter is a school teacher and, and, te and works with uh, children who are seriously uh, uh, troubled in, yeah. in California and I wanted to, it was, I wanted her to see me out there doing it at least once you know or twice and so I went back and never realizing that I would stay for the rest of my life. Now it's interesting because you left your first career at the peak I did. and why did you do that? I just things were you know, television, I, I, I had done it all, and I decided 
I had too many friends whose marriages went up in smoke because they were never in the house. And I didn't, I also, I was raised by two parents who were always there for me. They, you know, would, nobody was ever gone. And I decided that I wanted to get married and have a house and kids and devote myself to it completely. And um, I'm not very good at, you know, wearing more than one hat at a time. And so I just quit. Now here you were in Hollywood and you rose fast to a really high position. People knew who you were literally all over the country. And I'm sure you dated some interesting people too. And some not very interesting ones. Uh, who? <laughs> no, we're not going to get into that. Uh, yeah, I, I dated, you know, I mean. Very talented people. Very, you know, and, and had a lot of wonderful friends, yes. But you met somebody from Philadelphia. I did. Um, I, I had friends who knew this man and they were determined. I was in New York, I guess I was doing a nightclub, I can't even remember. Mm -hmm. And they were determined, they kept saying, you've got to meet Sam Rudofker, you've got to meet Sam Rudofker. And, and I said, who is Sam Rudofker? And they said, he owns After Six, the former work company, you've got to meet him. And I said, okay, sure, we'll work on it. And then I forgot about it. So it so happened that, that I was in California. I was in, no, it didn't happen in California. It happened in Chicago. I was in Chicago and Irv Kopsinet, you, you know, the big, who he was. Uh, came, I, I don't, but who is he? Uh, he was the biggest uh, television star and, and radio star uh, and uh, newspaper. He was the biggest newspaper man in Chicago. Gotcha, okay. And he marched in the very first night. I was getting ready to walk up on the stage at Mr. Kelly's, the jazz club in Chicago. And there's Irv, and Irv says, Peggy, Peggy, and ran over, and he said, I want you to meet somebody. This is Sam Rudofker. And I got his name wrong. I was on my way to the stage. I said, hello, Mr. Rudofsky, and got on the stage and <laughs> forgot about it. And then uh, about three or four months later, I married him. Wow, that fast. Not Irv Cups in it. No, no. <laughs> I know. And then uh, from that, you, you, you left show business. I did. I wanted to. I wanted a family. I wanted um, children. Okay, and you had how many? Two, a boy and a girl. Okay, and again, life isn't always easy, is it? No. Because you lost your son. I did. And how was that? How did that Suicide. happen? Suicide. Oh, geez. Do you have anything that you might say to somebody who has a child who, you know, might be leaning towards that end? It's, there, there's help today. There is help. There was no help in those days. I was all by myself in it. You know, we were, my husband and I, and there was no help of any kind. There were psychiatrists, but they really didn't help, you know? Uh, I, I think that if a child is troubled and, and needs help, the first thing to do is get them to, get them to a doctor. Mm -hmm. um, I, I couldn't have done anything that I didn't do. I don't mean that we didn't do everything we could. But sure you did. Uh, it's, uh, it changes your life. I mean, I'm not the same person that I was before Jonathan died. I, I would, I never was the same person again. In what way? I'm not quite as open. I'm not quite as fearless. I'm not quite as reckless. And when I say reckless, I mean, you know, I was always ready to, to get, you to know. To do the next th thing. Yeah. Three in the morning and we'd, let's go get some, you know. Um, I just, not, I mean, I, I never had a, any problem with drinking or smoking. I don't do either. But I just, um, I just would, I, I, I wish, that, I think there's more help now for someone like Jonathan who was bipolar and they never even heard of the word yet. Right. Years later, my doctor told me that he was bipolar. Mm -hmm. Which is what you call but manic, manic, manic depressive. depressive. Yeah. yeah, but today there's, there's a great deal more help for it, much, much more They help. know more. And one of the reasons I went back to singing is because wherever Jonathan is, he, he can would want hear me you. to sing. He can hear you. So tell us, now you're a member of Broadcast Pioneers. You're also in the Hall of Fame. Oh, yes. I do remember. Of course, and, I love to come there. And so tell me how this career got started, this new career, the new Peggy King. 
I, it just, I just sort of got pushed into it. <laughs> I wasn't really planning to do it, and then suddenly there I was, singing again. You know, I, I sang at something where somebody needed me very badly at a big benefit of some kind, which I've forgotten. And then suddenly everybody was saying, oh, you know, and I realized that there's a lot that I can do out there for people who need me. You know, I'm not trying to make a new career. I mean, uh, you know me well enough to know that's not what I'm doing. I'm, I love to sing and I'm happy to be singing, but I'm happy to be doing it and helping, helping you know, people as much as I can. You know, Don't you think this is also a, a way to motivate people who think their lives are over when they reach a senior citizen age. Perhaps that had something to do with it. Maybe, maybe you know, when you get past your 60s or into your 70s, I think maybe. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I never, uh, this trio that I work with, the All Jazz Trio, they're, you know, they found me and I'm, I'm just. And you're now needed again. Yeah, I'm working all the time, constantly. Okay. If I, now this may be a little tough, may extend us a little bit on this, but I have a, a closing question. If you had three wishes, and I could grant you those three wishes, okay, what would they be? But you've got to tell me in the next five seconds. Personal or? Uh, Personal or professional. Or all over. Anything. Well, I'd like to, for there never to be another war. I'd like the end of war. And I'd like them to find a cure for some of the really awful diseases that they don't seem to be able to take care of anybody. And I'd like people to be happier than they are. Very nice. And that's, Dan, I put you on the spot for that. <laughs> no, no, no. We know each other pretty well. You, you, you can't put me on the spot. I know that. <laughs> Peggy, thank you so, so thank much. You. you know, first, it's a pleasure to know you as a person. It's a pleasure to know you. And I thank you for the interview. And this is Pioneers of Philadelphia Broadcasting, thank you for seeing us.